Hello and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. Today's episode is another dive into the library of games released for what may go on to be Nintendo's best-selling console of all time, the Nintendo Switch. But first, a word from this episode's sponsor. This video is sponsored by DNA, developers of Pokemon Masters, a battling and strategy game for Android and iOS devices. In Pokemon Masters, players make an avatar and pair up with Pikachu to enter the Pokemon Masters League in the all-new region of Paseo Island. The game focuses on real-time three-on-three battles and lets players battle against and recruit Sync Pairs, which is a trainer and their Pokemon. There'll be sync pairs from every Pokemon game generation, including iconic characters like Brock and Misty, who are paired up with Onyx and Starmie. In battles, the more powerful an attack is, the more of the move gauge it uses, with the move gauge slowly filling over time. Each sync pair has their two trainer moves that don't consume any of the move gauge and can boost stats or heal your team. They also have a special sync move that can be used after a set number of attacks, meaning players have to be tactical. A Pokemon Masters event is available from now until December 19th, where Mewtwo and the infamous Team Rocket leader Giovanni will be added to the game. This limited time event lets players interact with Giovanni and Mewtwo in story episodes and gives the player a chance to add their sync pair to their teams. To get Pokemon Masters and participate in this time-sensitive event, you can download the game on Google Play using the link in the top of the description. Within 10 months of its release, the Nintendo Switch sold more units than the Wii U sold during its entire lifespan. By comparison, the Switch sold 14.86 million units in the first 10 months of its release, while the Wii U sold only 12.5 million units from its launch until it was discontinued in 2017. Although this is partly due to the Switch's unique and quite useful gimmick of functioning both as a home console and a handheld, its game library has no doubt been a big factor in its sales. Pokemon Sword and Shield certainly had a rough run-up to its release, but upon players getting hold of the title, many have come to enjoy it. It's also become the fastest-selling Switch game so far, selling more than 6 million copies in its opening weekend. And as you might expect, the game has quite a few interesting secrets that have already been found. One secret is that there's a very slight chance that a wild Pokemon will come to the player's Pokemon camp while they're playing in it and ask to join the player's team. If the player picks the Yes option, then not only will the Pokemon join the camp, but the player will have also caught the Pokemon, and it will go into one of the player's Pokeballs. Another incredibly popular Switch game is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. The plot of the game's World of Light adventure mode sees Kirby as the sole survivor of a cataclysmic invasion, leaving the Pink Pudge to rescue the other fighters one by one. Interestingly, this was actually director Masahiro Sakurai's original vision for the plot of Super Smash Bros. Brawl's Subspace Emissary. This early storyline was mentioned during a 2008 Iwata Ask segment, where Sakurai said, I had envisioned more of a serious tone for the story, something with some misfortune like a single character escaping total annihilation of his squadron and then fighting back while rounding up his allies. According to Sakurai in an interview with Famitsu, the reason why Kirby was the only one that survived Galeem's attack was because he was the only one who could plausibly escape using his Warp Star. This also made the character accessible to starters or newcomers to the game as a result of his speed and attacks. Some have pointed out that others should logically have been able to escape due to similar skills involving tremendous speeds, and that Sakurai, as Kirby's creator, may have just been a little biased in his choices. Another unused element from Brawl which was used in Ultimate was a voice clip for Snake. There. The voice clip in Ultimate for when Snake plants some C4 went unused in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, but is believed to have been used in the same way before it was cut. Kirby's star allies received middling reviews, being praised for its art style, soundtrack, and overall gameplay, however being taken to the cleaners over its apparently incredibly easy difficulty. Despite that, one interesting easter egg actually comes from the difficulty settings of one of the sub-games, the ultimate choice. Once the player is beaten the sixth difficulty, Fiery Showdown, or higher, the Soul Melter difficulty is unlocked. In the menu, with each increase in difficulty, Kirby's reaction gets more intense. The face he makes for the spiciest of difficulties is actually a reference to the episode Frog Wild from the Kirby anime series, Kirby Right Back At Ya. In the episode, Kirby is possessed by a demon frog that turns him evil. A fairly new addition to the Nintendo Switch's library is Platinum Games' Astral Chain. The game's sci-fi aesthetic is one of its more visually defining features, but the title originally started out with a fantasy setting. The initial concept had players use magic, but after the development team realized that there were lots of other games with fantasy settings, it was reworked into a more cyberpunk-inspired setting based on animes that the game's creator, Takahashi Taura, enjoyed watching such as Ghost in the Shell and Appleseed. 
Another more recent Switch title was the fairly well-received Yoshi's Crafted World. A lot of attention had clearly gone into the design of the game's world, even more than would be apparent by just playing the game. In an interview with Nintendo Dream that was translated by Nintendo Everything, the game's director, Masahiro Yamamoto, confirmed that the entire game actually takes place in a kindergarten class within the Mario universe. This also informed the themes each level had, with elements in the game being based on what you would find in a school for young children, such as a sandbox. Yoshi's Crafted World also has quite the range of easter eggs and secrets. One noteworthy nod references one of Mario RPG's outings, Mario & Luigi's Superstar Saga. In the game, a can of Star Beans iced coffee can be spotted in the flip-side version of the stage Poochie's Magma Run. This is a reference to the Star Beans Cafe, which was prominently featured in Superstar Saga. One game that took Nintendo and Sega fans by surprise was Mario & Sonic at the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020. The surprise in question was an entire game mode based around the 2D games that defined the franchises involved. Another piece of news that took gamers by surprise came on October 2nd, when it was revealed that just one day prior, Superstar Saga developers Alpha Dream had filed for bankruptcy. The company cited sluggish revenues and high development costs as the reason for filing. After the news broke, Liam Robertson, who creates Game History Secrets here on Did You Know Gaming, tweeted that he knew of one last project Alpha Dream worked on. Alpha Dream's involvement in the project hadn't yet been revealed, but the mystery game turned out to be Mario & Sonic 2020. This would be the last game Alpha Dream ever worked on, contributing to development alongside Sega and a few other studios. Another studio that's known to aid with development on large projects is Bandai Namco. As well as helping develop Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, the studio also aided Nintendo with the development of Mario Kart Tour, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and ARMS. This was recently revealed on the company's website, which stated they'd partially implemented in-game and 3D visual assets for courses and characters for Mario Kart Tour, and that they'd produced about half of the game's bonus challenges. The site also states that Bandai Namco produced about half of the visual assets for courses and characters in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and that they made about half of the visual assets for stages and fighters in ARMS. One Nintendo Switch game that's hot off the presses is The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. When the game was initially revealed, some fans were torn over the game's visuals. That said, they proved to be a selling point for many, who found the cute aesthetic with a heavy depth of field very alluring. The game's director, Eiji Aonuma, has shed some light on why the game looks the way it does, explaining that the tilt-shift effect was inspired by the original Game Boy version's vast but small world on the console's 66mm screen. Aonuma said, when I played the original Game Boy version, it was a small screen, and it felt like a small world, but very vast. And so, it kind of had this tilt-shift perspective, so that's why I thought this diorama-like art style would be perfect for the remake. Moving from one Switch Zelda title to another, it's no secret that Breath of the Wild has an incredible amount of easter eggs and references within it. And this goes for the game's downloadable content as well. Just a heads up, this is a minor visual spoiler for the end of the DLC. Inside the last room in the Sword Monk Shrine after completing the Trial of the Sword DLC, there are seven monks with their arms in different positions. The pose of each monk represents poses of the seven sages from The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Zelda's pose is taken from the final battle against Ganon, and the other six sages' poses are from inside the Chamber of Light after defeating the corresponding temples that release each sage. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia, and we've decided to talk about Castlevania Symphony of the Night. In a 1997 developer interview, the game's director, Koji Igarashi, and writer Tojiharu Furukawa were asked about their early and potentially unused ideas for the game. In the interview, translated by shmuplations.com, Igarashi stated, Our first idea was to use the story and setting of Vampire Killer and make the final Belmont Vampire Hunter your enemy. Another idea I had is that it was supposed to be Quincy Morris who defeated Dracula, but it was actually Alucard who defeated him in the final game. I'd even thought how this would work with the ending visuals. Also, the decision to make this a more exploratory action game was to extend the short life of normal action games a bit, and this was something we decided from the very beginning. Furukawa then added, At the time, the development section chief ordered us to make the Ultimate Dracula game. No one really knew what Ultimate meant. But the developers had talked it over, and the result was Symphony of the Night. So what do you all think? Ultimate Dracula. Try and picture that. I just picked a Symphony of the Night, you know what I mean? That's all we've got time for you today. 
I'll leave you with some Symphony of the Night music because I'm going to do that every single opportunity I get. What are we having today? I don't know, wood carving partita? Because it's the best one. No, I'm going to put something else. I'm going to surprise you guys. Don't worry about it. Forget about it. I got your back. Forget about it. Huh?